Hello and welcome back to the Sharks world, ladies and gentlemen. We're finally back in the seat after life decided to happen all at once. I had to move across the country, I had to get a wisdom tooth pulled, as well as a few other minor things. But we're finally back and we can finally cover this long awaited topic. The topic in question for today's video is Shark Week versus Shark Fest. This topic was actually requested by two gentlemen in the Sharks World Discord, so thank you to both of you for suggesting this topic. In this video, I'm going to be comparing three shows from each respective franchise and grading them based on a list of criteria that I've made based on how well they represent sharks and their reputation, among other things. So, without further ado, as always, ladies and gentlemen, grab you a Celsius, have a seat at the table, and let's compare Shark Week and Shark Fest. Before we get started, these are the shows that I'm going to be covering of each franchise. For Shark Week, it'll be Spawn of El Diablo, Rise of the Monster Hammerhead, and the Jackass Special. For Shark Fest, I'm going to be covering Game of Sharks, World's Biggest Hammerhead, and Shark Attack Files. The criteria I'm going to be creating these shows on are as follows. Narrative, to include the title. Shark Data, slash facts. Visuals, sound, and anything else that I deem noteworthy in the grading. So, let's start with Shark Week's El Diablo. The story behind this show is that a lady by the name of Michelle Jewell spotted one of the largest great white mating scars on a particular female in a given area, and since they have reappeared, she believes that it is the return of a shark named El Diablo. Before we even go any further, let's take a look at the name El Diablo. Literally translated, it means the devil. Already setting the narrative up rather well, wouldn't you agree? Based on what I saw, this show is basically another variation of a John story. And here's what I mean by that. When you watch the show, if you decide to, whenever they say the word Diablo, or it is mentioned, or it is shown, replace the name El Diablo with Jaws, and you will see what I mean. A lot of comments when sharks were actually showing up in messing with the decoy that they had in the water is about what you'd expect from Shark Week at this point. Some of these comments were things along the lines of, these sharks are very curious, yet aggressive, which their definition of aggressive most of the time was such the sharks taste testing or bumping the decoy in an attempt to figure out what it is. Because as I've said in previous videos, Sharks don't have limbs or thumbs like we do, so the only way they can figure out what something is, is with their mouth. At one point, a quote-unquote kill strike was just a small bite on the camera. They also did the typical speeding up a lot of cameras or slowing some of them down and adding sensational music to really attempt to hype up the showing of Mr. El Diablo, which when a shark did showed up and they thought it was truly El Diablo. If you pay attention, you will notice the shark that they quote unquote said was El Diablo was roughly the same size as the decoy. So overall, I would say that this was a rather poor showing for Shark Week, but expected. Very poor, but expected. Next, we'll go over Shark Week's Rise of the Great Hammerhead, and it's been following a recent trend of a number of shows attempting to find these record-sized hammerhead sharks. Typically, when you see some sort of video on Instagram or YouTube or wherever of a hammerhead, in particular the Great Hammerhead, it's typically about a 14, 15, maybe the occasional 17 footer, but none of them have been the 20 footer that are on the record sized. The goal and premise of these shows are to find a quote unquote monster hammerhead. 
even though they're not monsters, but I digress. There are some pretty big hammerheads that appear in this show and all the other ones, but they're not the largest, and the largest is what sells, according to them. Similar to the previous show, Spawn of El Diablo, Rise of the Monster Hammerheads overhypes a lot of the situations whenever these sharks did show up. Also like the previous show, whenever they decided to name some facts about the sharks, it's usually the generic the shark is this big, they have this many senses, etc. They never go over any of the new facts, or some of the more interesting low-key facts that a lot of shark enthusiasts would be interested in. For example, from an evolutionary standpoint, the group hammerheads, all nine species of them, are the youngest as comparison to all other sharks, so who knows, we might be seeing more of them as time goes on. Or the fact that, from a brain standpoint, hammerheads have one of, if not the largest brain of all sharks, probably due to the shape of their head, but I digress from that point. But the thing that really gets me about these type of shows is the ridiculousness of the overhyping of any situation. A shark makes a simple move, music flares up and they're saying, oh man, this is the calm before the storm. Speeding up cameras and just making things seem a lot worse than they actually are. And the music doesn't help. The music makes it sound like that they're in an action movie, which they are not. The narrative being that this elusive monster hammerhead is eventually going to go to some sort of beach and terrify swimmers, maybe even kill them. Whereas in reality, as I've pointed out in previous videos, and you can look this up for yourself, no hammerhead has ever killed anybody. None. Have there been attacks? Sure. But no fatalities. This show, like the previous one, was disappointing, but was to be expected for the way Shark Week's marketing scheme works. So, without further ado, let's go on to the final show, the Jackass Special. I imagine most of you understand that any show involving Jackass should immediately tell you everything you need to know about what the contents of this show is going to be like. Of all the shows that I watched for this video, this one was the most difficult to get through mostly because of the ridiculousness for it. And it just makes it more and more apparent that Shark Week has clearly lost the plot when it comes to what Shark Week is supposed to be about. Whether it's stating facts that an eighth grader could figure out, for example, how sharks use their tails to swim. I'm not kidding, that's one of the facts that they stated in the video, to focusing more on the people rather than the sharks, to, in typical jackass fashion, doing some downright irresponsible pranks or moves for the sake of entertainment. One particular thing to note about this show is that one of the members of Jackass, Chris, was actually bitten by a shark. He was bitten on the hand, and luckily he survived. The injury wasn't terribly serious. The medical professionals did jump in the water to help him out to get out of the water, but at a certain point, one has to ask, what did you expect when you're performing very risky, very dangerous stunts splashing in the water with sharks? I've said it before, many others have said it before, and we will all say it again. Sharks are still animals. The potential for an attack is always still there. Is it likely? No. But when you perform stunts like this, at some point it's going to become an inevitability. Now if you ask me, the shark wasn't really in feeding mode. There was a splash, it was trying to figure out what was going on because they're used to feeding the sharks near the boats. So I would say this is a case of mistaken identity. But if you ask me, the true tragedy in all this is that Shark Week and Jackass got a huge boost in popularity because of this little stunt here. What's the phrase? If it bleeds, it leads. And this definitely was the lead story during Shark Week when this happened. Once again, I will say that I am glad that Mr. Chris is okay and that he wasn't severely injured. But at what cost was this little stunt? What cost to the shark's reputation? This is often the case with many things. 
will do this stunt for popularity for a boost in ratings at the cost of Shark's reputation. So in terms of grading overall for Shark Week, with 10 being the highest, with narrative, I give them a 2. Most of the narratives that they had were just rehashes of some sort of Jaws show, just like I stated with the spawn of El Diablo. Replace any name of a shark that they are talking about with Jaws and you'll see what I mean. For shark data and facts, I'll give it a 5. Technically, most of what they were saying in regards to like how their senses work, sizes, etc. wasn't incorrect, but it's generic. It's stuff that we've all heard before and is covered in almost every shark documentary. Visuals, I will give them a 3. There's still an abnormal amount of speeding up and slowing down cameras to make sharks look way more menacing than they need to, so that's still not going to be a very high score for Shark Week. Sound, similar to visuals, it's they're either making things sound like an action movie or some sort of horror sensational movie. Nothing really just showing sharks or making it sound like sharks are just in their environment acting. So overall, I would give Shark Week a score of three and a quarter out of 10, which is not very impressive. But as I've already stated, I wasn't expecting much from Shark Week. But enough about them. Let's go ahead and move on to who they're up against in this video, Shark Fest. The first show we're going to be going over for Shark Fest is Game of Sharks, obviously playing off of Game of Thrones. The story behind this particular show is that it's some sort of Olympic-like competition between sharks. This has been done before by other shows, but this one seems to be much more aimed at kids. The categories from which they used were Ultra Marathon, Eating Contest, Sharpshooter, Team Relay, Speed, Best Bite, Heavyweight, High Jump, Senior Tour, and finally something called Speed Feed. So I'm going to be straight with you. Half of these categories didn't need to be here. It sounds like some of them were added just to extend the time. That and there was a very clear narrative to make the Great White Shark win this whole competition because of some of these added categories and that's just the narrative because the Great White Shark is something that is known as a charismatic species. Read the book Why Sharks Matter and you'll understand what I mean. But in regards to how these categories were ranked, it seemed rather strange. Let, let me explain what I mean. The first two categories seemed pretty straightforward ultra marathon and eating contest with ultra marathon being miles recorded as far as a distance goes which makes sense and for the eating contest volumes eaten which the whale shark won that one it's the biggest shark eats the most makes sense but then when we get to the third column when it comes to sharpshooter obviously the hammerhead won that one but the category of sharks that they used for this competition seemed very small as there was no mention for sharks along the lines of silky sharks for those of you who don't know when it comes to hearing silky sharks have one of if not the best hearing of all sharks according to scientists yet there is no mention of them here well it's not something i'm necessarily going to ding them on i just found it strange probably because Folks don't do as much research as I do and some other individuals do as well, but I digress. The fourth category, Team Relay, was won by the Grey Reef Shark. Now, I might be nitpicking a bit here, but this one surprised me a bit. And the reasoning is, for those of you who have followed me for a while, you know that I have an entire video explaining about sharks, in particular the sand tiger shark, can be just as social as mammals. So I'm surprised that they didn't get any mention in this particular category, even if they didn't win. In fact, there weren't really a lot of facts in general when they made the Great Reef Shark the winner. And the same goes for the next category, which is speed, which unsurprisingly, the Mako Shark won this one. But what I mean by lack of facts is there is no mention of the second fastest shark in the world, 
the salmon shark being clocked in at 50 miles an hour behind the mako sharks 60. Again, all of this might be a little bit nitpicky, but for those of you who do a lot of research on sharks like myself, you probably could have named all these facts off rather easily, but I digress. The sixth category, the best bite, was also won by the mako shark, and it won this category because its teeth are designed to hold on to slippery prey. Wait, hold on, what? No, no, that, that, that's the reason they gave. Huh. Okay, now I remember. It was at this point that I really, really stopped taking this show serious at all. There's over 400 species of sharks out there. Well over 400. Tons with unique bites and unique ways that they use particular things. There's whale sharks with their tiny teeth. There's cookie cutter sharks, port jackson's, nurse sharks. Heck, even the big three have unique ways they use their teeth. And out of all of these, they picked a winner because of them being able to hold on to slippery prey. Not to say that the Mako shark's teeth aren't effective, because they are. There's a reason they've survived for so long, but the way they pick winners for these categories is I I I don't I don't take it serious. Like at all. Personally, if you ask me, there's no best way to use a bite. If it gets the job done, then the bite's effective. I wouldn't necessarily argue as to which one is more effective than the other. It's more a matter of, does it work? Yes. Then that's probably where the conversation should end. But I digress. These last four are, I'm gonna cover rather quickly because again, this is when I really stopped taking the show serious. Number seven, heavyweight, the whale shark one, no surprise, biggest shark, moving on. The high jump, Mako shark, it jumps the highest 30 feet, got it, cool. Senior tour, Greenland shark, Oldest shark, oldest living vertebrae in the world. Cool, got it. And then the final category was speed feed. As in, which shark eats the quote unquote fastest? The great white shark won this one, but they didn't really define how it won. <sighs> if you ask me, I don't think the people writing the show took it very serious. And that's a shame, because I think this was a missed opportunity to really cover some lesser known sharks and really tell about some interesting facts about some sharks that we all know and love. Not to mention that some of the language they were using in the show doesn't really help out the reputation. For example, one thing I kept hearing was them talking about a gang of sharks rather than saying what an actual group of sharks is called, a shiver. So the show was okay if you were a child, but if you're someone like me, I'd skip it. So now let's move on to the next show for Shark Fest, World's Biggest Hammerhead. The narrative behind this show is that a group of scientists are attempting to find a record-sized great hammerhead shark and shockingly, and this made the show in my opinion better than all the others, is that these scientists were searching for accuracy. The fact that out of this entire video, we're just now running into something that is searching for accuracy is sad if you ask me. With that being said, this was the show that I enjoyed the most out of all of them. Starting with the facts, they make a very good distinction that is oftentimes missed when it comes to animal sizes. They say that the hammerhead rivals sharks like the tiger and the great white in length, but not in weight. Where size, the biggest, is usually depicted by weight, not length, which is a common mistake a lot of people make, so I appreciated that distinction. As far as the visual clips go, they were not very natural. There wasn't a lot of speeding up or slowing down or sound effects. It was just showing the sharks swimming in their natural environment, i.e. what sharks are mostly like. So that was very much appreciated. As far as sound goes, the soundtrack was very much along the lines of a great epic adventure. Now mind you, the script was rather predictable, 
but it not trying to be super extra was the biggest reason as to why I found it so enjoyable because it was about the sharks. Let's move on to the final show for Shark Fest, which was Shark Attack Files. Now I took several issues with this show, and let me explain to you why that is. In the first file, it was one bite that was done by a bull shark. Obviously, they hyped it up to seem like an epic event that was way worse than it actually was. Now mind you, I am glad that the individual survived and that they weren't hurt terribly bad. But going on to the actual point, one thing they highlighted is that bull sharks have at least 100 confirmed attacks on people. Remember that number for a sec. Remember in a previous video when I brought up how the media, they won't necessarily lie to you, but they won't tell you the whole truth? Keep that in mind. Another thing they were doing was asking questions that have been known facts for a very long time. For example, gentleman asking, what's a shark doing in shallow waters? When it has been a known fact that sharks not only swim in shallow waters very often, but bull sharks can swim in both salt and fresh water. Now for the second file, it was again one bite. But here's the really deceptive part when they were going through this particular file. They said that shark attacks in North Carolina increased by 27%. Now, on the outside looking in, it'd be like, oh my God, that's a huge jump. But let me work the math out for you. Remember that number that I told you to remember with bull sharks as to how they have over 100 attacks? The part that they didn't tell you in regards to that is that that's over 100 attacks over 400 years. If we take a look at the shark attack file, the number is actually 119 attacks. But the part they don't tell you about is it's 93 non-fatal bites and 26 fatal bites. So that's the first part that they didn't tell you about. But here's the second part. When they said increased by 27%, what number are they comparing that to? Because if we just take 119 and we say 27% of that, that's 32 attacks. And we know 32 attacks didn't take place over the span of a year, which is what they were comparing it to. They specifically said that shark attacks from the previous year to the year that that attack happened increased by 27%. If we were to divide 400 by 119, that would equal 3.3, which means in order for that to happen consistently over the years, that would have to be exactly 3.3 attacks. We'll just say three for the sake of this video, three attacks per year. So if we were to take that number as a base and say that that number increased by 27% for the next year, that means that the attacks increased by one. Technically it's 0.8, but you get the point. That's the type of stuff I'm talking about. That is the stuff that destroys reputations of both shark and man. When people don't necessarily lie to you, but they don't tell you the whole truth. At one point in the show, they brought up Megalodon for an ever so brief moment and they got the facts about it wrong as well, seeing that the great white shark evolved from the megalodon, when it has been known for years, maybe even decades, that the great white shark and the megalodon existed at the same time. That's why they have different scientific names now. That's why there is Otidus megalodon and Carcharodon carcaris. For them to make such a basic mistake just goes to show you how serious they took this show, which is not very serious at all. So, for a final verdict for Shark Fest, for a narrative, I give them a four. Even though there is still a lot of aspects of it that are very Jaws-like, and Game of Sharks is a show that I just can't take serious off principle, the Hammerhead show did a lot of justice for Shark Fest. For facts, I'm going to give them the same score as Shark Week, a five, because again, Technically, all that they said wasn't incorrect, but with the shark attack files, that did a lot of damage for it. For visuals, I'll give them a three. Again, with the hammerhead portion, 
they were showing some natural clips, so that did it justice, but all the other ones were not really up to snuff. For sound, I will give them a four. While it's better than Shark Week, it could be much better. This gives Shark Fest an overall score of four. So yes, technically it is better than Shark Week, but not by much. However, I will say from an opportunistic standpoint, there is room to grow. If anybody here works with or works on Shark Fest, hear me now. The Jaws era has been over for a very long time. A lot of people are catching on to the fact that sharks aren't as bad as the media has made them seem. But it appears both Shark Week and Shark Fest have missed the boat. Shark Fest, you have an opportunity right now to beat Shark Week to the punch. You have a chance to once again return to the days where documentaries were about the sharks, asking questions of things we never considered with sharks, like shark intelligence, looking at different things that we don't know about them, or exploring some of the lesser known species. For example, did you know that there is such thing as a graceful shark, as in literally has a scientific name and everything, a species of shark known as the graceful shark. That's the type of stuff people will never figure out if we keep focusing on the Jaws era style of shows. If neither Shark Week or Shark Fest does it, somebody else is going to beat them to the punch. Might even be me if I play my cards right. With that ranting aside, this is going to be where we end this video. I know it was a long time coming, and thank you for those of you who were patient and stuck around until I got it out. But we're back in the seat, I have a ton of videos lined up for you guys, and we're definitely going to push even harder than we did last year in 2023. So as always, thank you very much for giving me some of your time, and I will see you in the next video. Until then.